Why you working so hard? The world is ending. Yay! It's the apocalypse. Take a day off. Take a day off. It's all meaningless. And lo, then I saw a beast coming out of the sea. It had ten horns and five heads. On each of its horns there was a crown, and on each of its heads there was a veiled insult to other esoteric podcasts. Welcome to Talk Gnosis. We're back with our panel. <laughs> um and we are okay so the jason jason memel you know co-host you know for years now he's been like i want to do the book of revelation i love the book of revelation i love jesus and talking about jesus in the book of revelation can we do book of revelation so jason your, your time has finally come so we What's are the... doing a panel on the the redheaded stepchild the bastard kid of the joe and i um canon the uh the book of revelation uh i could also call this a you know other one of the other criticisms I, I i get of the show is that uh you're talking about stuff that doesn't matter it's not about the current world it's about some boring stuff from the 1800s but this is a rip from the headline show so <laughs> uh... <laughs> I also have to say, what's what's the cross between slander and heresy? Like when you're putting words in my mouth <laughs> biblically. Slaracy. Slaracy, there we go. Yeah. Hander. <laughs> so, so, it, it, is, it, is, it is okay to shit talk the other podcasts then? <laughs> no, no, it's not. Are you sure? Yeah. Oh, I'll cross that off my list. All right. Okay, although that... that... <laughs> I was thinking I put that in because this is this is like uh, uh do, do you folks all know what a subtweet is? Nick, you're you're on Philemic Twitter. You know what a subtweet is. Oh yeah, it, it's all over. The, and Philemic Twitter is so small, you know who everyone's referring to with every yeah. tweet too. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. So like a uh, like like a subtweet would be like the uh, you know there's there's an there, there's a certain Philemic the writer from New York who has an Italian mixed Italian Chinese background and he doesn't know the shit about anything, right? So I'm not actually actually addressing who I'm talking about, but everybody knows. Um, and this is sort of like the book of subtweets. That's what got me thinking about it, Clark, because they're they're <laughs> arguing with so many people and calling out so many people from fellow Christians to Rome, but we've yes. lost that context. So, <laughs> so we, you know, all the people reading the book at the time would have been like, oh, I know who they're talking uh, shit about. I'll leave out the the S word, uh, but uh, 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 we don't know now. So this is for me the book of subtweets. That's what got me thinking about uh, um, uh, verbally subtweeting. Uh, we love everybody. We love all other podcasts. I only found out. Did, did you guys actually know there's other esoteric podcasts? I only found out today. No, I do. I've never listened to any of them. So. Oh, good. <laughs> Anyways, so the Book of Revelation, uh, like, I'm sure we're going to have some disagreements. We're all going to have different interpretations. We're going to talk about some scholarship, talk about our personal notices about the book. But I think we can all agree that this book is about vaccine passports, right? Yeah, obviously. Okay, cool. Okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Moving on. Of course, yeah. <laughs> I've already got the, my tattoo uh, to my forehead. I'm going through the healing process. That's why you can't. That's why I won't. Oh, look at oh yeah, that's right. That's 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 well, in your head. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, uh, it it turns out that head was actually a metaphor for mask. Oh, 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 oh of course. Oh, Duh. Thank you, Jason. <laughs> Thank you, Jason. <laughs> okay, everybody. Well, we figured it out. Okay. Uh, yeah. There we go. Yeah. Okay. Show's over. <laughs> <laughs> that was easy. <laughs> um, <laughs> Let's just go around and talk about what we like about this book and what we hate about it. Uh, you can also switch that order around. Uh, since since it was uh, the, the, everybody heard my uh, my my slurricy. Um, uh Jason, what did you love about this book and what did you hate about it? <laughs> uh, my my um, like I, I feel like my job on these Bible episodes is to is to be like Mister Hot Take because I have no real emotional connection. To these, yeah. um, uh, uh, is um, that I think this is a really cool book. It's just a shame it's in the Bible. Like uh, it's <laughs> it's full of all this like interesting imagery and historical context and the subtweeting, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But then like it's like it just looks like it's this neutron bomb of of bad uh, uh, bad possibilities and ways to continue to leverage it badly for centuries. And so it's like, you know, it's one of those things where like, I'm, I'm actually kind of imagining whoever actually wrote it back then, like coming to now and getting like a history of all of the people who've ever used the re revelations to defend something, including the church itself for all of those centuries. And just being like, 
oh no oh no <laughs> i'm so sorry you know because it's just like it it's it's beautiful but it's also it also feels like it's a loaded gun when you assume that everything in the bible is is uh um meant to be taken the same way from the from the first page to the last yeah yeah uh deacon angie what did what did you love about it what did you hate about it um i have felt like a good part of my my spiritual background has been avoiding the book of revelation so i um did appreciate the opportunity to read it i mean it's one of those things that you know what Jason was just describing was really fantastic of, of like, there's so much going on in imagery. I, I personally, I don't know if it's just I'm a very pragmatic person and, and find the imagery a little tedious or it's definitely a difficult read for me, but, but hearing somebody that will bring up later Margaret Barger talk about it was very interesting. Um, but apart from it as a standalone text in the, context of the bible it's definitely something that i have not particularly enjoyed yeah it does th th there's an awful lot of like angels opening up scrolls and then the seventh angel coming again and smiting and fire and that that just keeps happening <laughs> over and over again and i think the initial part of my spiritual life was in the evangelical community so mm. it definitely has had a okay uh i can take part a and not deal with the book of revelations and kind of meander my way through this moment um and so looking at it from a different perspective as a gnostic you know does soften that stance a little bit but but it's almost like i've had to protect myself against the book of revelations in my previous spiritual experiences and i'm probably not the only one that has sort of had to navigate that space yeah, hundred percent. I think it is a very triggering book for a lot of people who who grew up in the evangelical community and had bad experiences of that community. Um, uh, Nick Pachetti, what what did you love about it? What did you hate about it? Yeah, um, this is it's interesting. I really love the book. It's been it's been really important to me and my my own spirituality. So actually, <laughs> preparing for this podcast compared to the ones we did on John and Mark, I was a little nervous about it because I actually the book is important to me in a way that. I guess those other ones aren't as much, but also it's hard to read. And, and I, even reading it for this, it's still difficult to read. So there's some element of like, you know, it, it feels a little bit like something. And I guess people in this world would understand it's more like it's initiatory in some way. It, it doesn't feel like something that should be like books like, you know, the evangelical like Revelation for Dummies books or something that's like, here's this is about America, like all that kind of that way of talking about it to me feels like dangerous, both dangerous and just kind of like stepping on the, actually this book as a kind of a, a initiatory experience that should maybe be kept for, you know, people that are ready for it in a certain way and not necessarily something that we kind of throw around. <laughs> so, um, so even that I was kind of, it gave me a little pause thinking about speaking about it just because, yeah, it does feel like this, it, it does feel particularly sacred to me, but it also feels worrying to you know bring out in the open in that way so like i'm thinking a certain thing i was just looking up is like the eastern orthodox community um revelation isn't like discouraged from people to read it but also it's like you shouldn't read it outside of a certain context it's kind of dangerous and there's been people like martin luther even have wanted to throw it out of the bible so it's you know it's been a controversial book yeah, it, it, um, it, it's been controversial from the very beginning. Uh, there's lots of Christian communities for the first, uh, we're talking four or five, six hundred years of Christianity that, that would leave it out. So so we have almost complete biblical canons without the Book of Revelation. It's uh, it's pretty common in early manuscripts. Uh, you find lots of, of Proto-Orthodox and, and other uh, Christian groups being like, uh, this book is garbage. Um, so, but, but I do agree. And I, I think, you know, uh, probably the whole panel does as well, right. About being careful with it. And I kind of like, you know, that, that Eastern Orthodox approach, right. Which is, you know, let's, let's use this sparingly. Let's, let's be very careful of our interpretations. Let's not flash that out into the liturgy and such, uh, all the time or, or bringing these readings, yada, yada. Uh, Clark, uh, what do you love about the book? What do you hate about it? Uh, well, what I love about it is that, uh, if there is ever a sacred text i was asking to be turned into a graphic novel this was it yeah. it's very visual it's very stark it's very colorful and just today i was imagining what it would be like if we could get like alan moore and uh, that dude who wrote the invisibles to do each side one of them picks like <laughs> the great beast and the other one picks god 
and like because hey those two hate guys usually hate each other right and just have them go at each other in this with this book anyway it's a great idea i think but that's never going to happen so no. uh the thing i hate about it is um there's a, the, a lot of the abuse that comes with this book um so a lot of people have had personal abuse with this in the evangelical context it's it's using the it's they use it to beat you over the head spiritually um constantly browbeating you with it but there's also this book is also used for a lot of um you know killing people quite honestly uh to be very blunt and a lot of folks use see this as an excuse to you know american evangelicals like to interfere in politics in israel and between israel and palestine because of this book because of the stuff that's in this book and uh that that i so i think that the problems with this book are even bigger than 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 we've mentioned so far like it's international it's yeah. really weird it's yeah. very strange um yeah i, I mean I, I i completely agree with you and and the whole panel for like nick this has always been a special book for me um and one that um uh, has been very important for my personal spirituality ever since i was young and i i find even though the symbolism does get a little bit repetitive again it's so visual it's so weird it's so freaking heavy metal that that <laughs> i just can't look away but the some of the beauty in it as well right because you do have this this redemption of the poor the the redemption of those that are sacrificed right there's the ending the original ending which we'll get to which i'll probably read out that i that i might even tear up right uh because i i find it so so powerful and moving um lately i've been having some some issues with with utopianism uh i, I think it's still good to to struggle for for a better world so 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 with this kind of recent um uh, my, my recent issues with utopianism, of course, this does end with a utopian vision, which I, I do find still powerful and moving. Um, and obviously how the book has been abused and is currently abused and has been used to, to oppress people, has been used to, to start wars, has been used. And of course, within the book itself, right? It is, if, if you do not agree with the writer of the book, you are going to the lake of fire. And this, and this, this is other Christians as well. It's, it's a very stark black and white, uh, dualistic book in many respects. But I, I you know, the symbolism gets me. It's, it, it, I, I find it just, you know, the, the woman with the, with the stars and the moon and her feet it just is it's so so moving um okay so uh so obviously i, I think we all agree that that this is a not a book that accurately predicts the future um uh, but i i couldn't i and please forgive me i couldn't i couldn't but help but throw this in but uh so the passage then the third angel blew his trumpet a large star burning like a torch dropped from the sky and fell on the third of the rivers and on the springs of the of the water the name of this star is quote-unquote wormwood a third of the water turned bitter, and many people died from drinking the water because it turned bitter. Does does anybody know the Ukrainian word for wormwood? Is it Chernobyl? It's Chernobyl, yeah. So you can imagine in the 80s, I'm sure some evangelicals were, were freaking out. I'm sure some evangelicals are freaking out now, right, with yeah. everything going on. So I couldn't, sorry, I know that I, especially with what's going on in the world, but I couldn't resist but put it in. But again, everybody, this is not a book that, act, that is going to accurately predict the future. Um, well, wait, please do not so apply it to all events. When I read that this time, I was thinking about how absinthe is, worm, is like a wormwood. Yeah. So I was, I thought it made the water into absinthe this time. That's what I pictured. That seemed fun. <laughs> That that's a lot like better. A late 19th yeah, century yeah. symbolist painting. Yeah. That is a very. That's a much more enjoyable end of the world. I vote yeah. for that one. Yeah. <laughs> um. Do so. This book is in the the Joe and I canon, right? Uh, and, and what I mean by that is is the opening has uh, is said to be by by a John, uh, a John of Patmos. The other thing too is is it uses uh, specific verbiage that we find in the Gospel of John and the Epistles of John. So so people have always seen a connection to. to to, to the early Joanites. And I, I am a fan of, of Raymond Brown's theories about an early Joanine community, about that community having Gnostic leanings and having schisms that become more Gnostic. This this used to be a, a more mainstream uh, uh, scholarly view, although you know, lately it's been sort of falling out of view, but I, I, I think it's accurate. What I, I do see some sort of you know, some Gnostic-y stuff around the edges, right? Uh, particular, uh, um, uh, particularly with some of the divine female figures, with the idea of of this of this fallen world, of these suggestions of of, of uh, rulers in the stars. What and uh, Clark, this is maybe something that, uh, uh, maybe something to think about or speculate. Uh, I really love. Um, 
uh, the bullshitting of Clark online. You know, I, I, I will have um, a, a little a, a little theory uh, about biblical studies and blow it out into a whole alt history. But I, I, I can't see how this book isn't in some way in dialogue with the secret book of John which is the Gnostic text that opens up with a guy named John having a revelation from Jesus Christ. And then that revelation is not about the future, it's about the past, but it's also patterned uh, on Genesis. And there's a lot of uh, Genesis mm -hmm. talk in, in this particular book. So uh, that just seems like a little too, you know, one-to-one -one for me. So I don't know if they're subtweeting each other, if they're completing each other, really what's going on here. But I, I think there's some kind of connection. But uh, actually, Clark, what, 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 do, you, do you see Gnosis in this book? Do you see whatever Gnosticism is? Do you see Gnostics using this book? What do you think about Gnosticism in the book of Revelation? Yeah, go for it, Clark. Uh, well, so, uh, okay, well, that was kind of my whole thing. So, oh, I mean, just, just reading through, I mean, I've read it multiple times, but it's been several years since I've read it. And, um, so I kind of agree, like, I only see any actual Gnosticism at the edges. Uh, two or three mentions of the Nicolaitans, who were supposed to be antinomian Gnostic communities. We don't know anything about them. But the reader, many readers of this book at the around the time it was put out would have seen the Nicolaitans like that. So um, between the, the, the first seven chur uh, churches at the beginning, he's giving warnings. He specifically brings up the Nicolaitans saying they're acting like Nicolaitans or they're allowing Nicolaitans to be in their midst and all the rest of this. So clearly very solidly not Gnostic. That throws it out of the Gnostic camp um, because it's rejecting any possible Gnostic groups and it doesn't seem to re replace them with anything that re resembles any kind of Gnosis in my mind. What I saw was if you apply a Gnostic worldview to this as a, as a lens to view the whole story through, I don't see a Gnostic story where you would normally see where like, and this is how the, the Gnostics are separate from everybody and this is how they'll be saved. Like that's not in this book. What's in this book in my mind is the Archons on one side and Jesus is specifically called quote, Archon of the Kings of the Earth. So he's, Basic, they're basically saying from the Gnostic point of view, not from the point of view of the author. From my point of view, there's basically calling Jesus the Demiurge or something Demiurgical-like. Yeah. And then that opposed- up with John's stuff. Say, say again? I thought that also syncs up with John's stuff, right? That oh, yeah, 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 right. The Demiurge yeah, and the, yeah. the opening of John, yeah. Right, right. right. no, it does, it does, it yeah. does. That's very true. And then um, the Archons versus the deceiving spirit of this world. Yeah. which is a very also a very Gnostic idea. And so the very loose concept I got, which is what led to my graphic novel idea, was <laughs> that the spiritual archons from the Gnostic point of view, the planets, the, 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 the lords, the, the angels of the planets, which get mentioned later, the seven planets in Jesus, the archon's hand, um, on one side versus, you know, in this more, I wouldn't say spiritual angle, but I was thinking it more of like a psychological angle. So you see what I'm saying? The, yeah. Not the pneumatics, but the psychics versus um, the deceiving spirit in the world, which would have been, you know, the deceiving spirit that was created by the archons to keep human beings tricked and all the rest of this. this uh, it shows up under different names in various Gnostic texts. And so these guys are fighting each other. So the enemy, it has a schism in its camp and it's fighting each other. The more material side versus the more psychological side. Yeah. And then I had fun with it. That means <laughs> that's the only way I could get Gnosis out of this. Yeah. I, I think it, it lends itself well to all sorts of interpretations, right? Yeah. Because it's so wild, because it doesn't, you know, it's some of, you know, the Rome stuff, which we'll get into, is very obvious, but a lot of stuff is very obscure, and the symbolism is so powerful. And they, they may not be specifically Gnostic themes, like, you know, just the idea of Gnosis, of Ascent, of Revelation, of the Divine Feminine, you know, those do belong to, to other streams of mystical religion. But at the same time, they are found in Gnostic Gnosticism, uh, uh, and uh, I think you, you can add sort of a, a, a Gnostic patina to this. I, I think it's a book that could be interpreted by Gnostics. Also, for right. the Nicolaitans, I, I'm pretty sure that 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 there's that this book went through some redactions, right? And that the uh, possibly just like the Secret Book of John, that the beginning and the end were tacked on later. Um, one of the reasons that, that I think this is you can take them off and it reads just fine. But also the book ends, which I think is the fake ending. If anyone adds anything to this, 
God will add to his or her punishment the plagues ascribed in the book. If anyone takes away from the prophetic books of the of the prophetic words of this book, the same. So why does he put that in there? That seems really sus to me, right? Yeah. Because yeah. when biblical writers do stuff like that, that means that they're doing it a lot of the times, right? So he's he's saying this because the editor did that himself with an earlier text. So um uh, 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 Jason, do you do you see any any gnosticism in here? Any gnosis? Any way that you could you could squeeze uh, some gnosis in, uh, like squeezing uh, uh, juice from an orange? <laughs> um, well, I'm I'm always of the mind that uh, if gnosis is something that's kind of implicit in in the world, then it can be discovered anywhere. Like it can be discovered in 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 uh, in the perfectly banal or even the 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 trash of the world kind of thing um not that i'm saying that this is trash uh, although i am trash talking revelations quite a bit um but uh so like vibes that i got reading this were that um that they there may have actually been an attempt to like absorb some of the cool world building that the gnostics were doing um you know and uh, and just kind of go like okay that's neat but we still need to keep it like kind of within the lines of our of our orthodoxy. So, like, um, you know, so we 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 have like a cool female figure, but she's kind of also slutty. You know what I mean? Like, so we're uh, it's kind of it's kind of this um, uh, complimenting by stealing, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, so that was kind of a vibe I got from it. Um, uh, there was. Uh, yeah, I think that's probably the closest in terms of like something where I, I would say any sort of explicit Gnosticism. I think there is some, I think it is interesting how much of what's in here comes from books and scrolls and like, um, and is about this sense of like transmission through narrative. And so I think there's maybe something like I'm big on Gnosticism narrative as it is. So I think it's, it's interesting that those are dominant symbols in this, in this book that I think uh, uh, both elevates the book itself that you're reading but also like reading and books in general as a way to to, to kind of absorb that yeah you know i, I forgot at the at the beginning of, of one of the reasons i love this book so much is because of its its influence on art uh uh the, the all sorts of art right but i think of uh, i really love umberto echo he's kind of obsessed with this book it's a big plot line in name of the rose it's a big plot line in the mysterious queen uh, mysterious flame of queen loana uh it's been it's it's it's, it's a bit of a, the symbolism and the wildness of the book has, has been a great artistic prompt for the last two thousand years um uh, 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 Deacon Angie, do you do you see gnosis? Do you see gnosticism in this book, or do you see any way that we can uh, we can punch it around to, to to get it out? I mean, I think it's one of those tricky things where you know, if you twist yourself hard enough, I'm sure sure you could get get that gnosis experience from it. I I um I I can only talk about this in the regards to Margaret Barker, so I'm not sure if you want me to get into that yet, or if you want to pause on that. You know what? Let's let's come back to that. I'll mm -hmm. ask Nick, and then I'm going to stop going around for the just you know start just throwing out my questions, and then we can all just jump in. You know what I mean? Just Perfect. To I, get just, to I didn't want to throw you off the rails, today. but I'm like, the, like that's the only thing that I can get gnosis from. So I'll okay. Let's uh, let's come back to that. But uh, Nick, um, so I guess if if we're talking about gnosis as you know the what we what people say of gnosticism is, <laughs> I feel like this book is pretty anti gnostic in a lot of ways. So. You do have the ascent, like I think we are, we've talked a little bit about and are going to talk about in the sense of John gets taken up into heaven and sees these visions and there's that kind of narrative. So he's receiving this kind of secret knowledge. But then, and, and this, to be honest, personally, is what I actually like about this book. And I probably am a little bit more of an orthodox. I'm not particularly orthodox, but my, my, a lot of my ideas come, on the, come out the other end of orthodox Christianity. So I would say that this book is like supremely orthodox almost because what ends up happening is a descent and not an ascent. So, you know, and it's a universal kind of thing that happens. So in Revelation 21, which I'm sure we'll talk about more of the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. Um, it's actually a very material universe that is ends up being created through this kind of cosmic process that the book describes. So to me, that's almost the opposite of a like Gnostic in the sense of, you know, escaping from this kind of material world if you take that i know that that's more complicated than Nazism, but like this is actually a description of the the material universe kind of kind of in an imminent way becoming divine or sacredness becoming present and for me it's like a death of god theology thing which maybe i get into later 
And so it actually follows the orthodox kind of logic of incarnation and crucifixion and, and resurrection very closely. Um, that might be because of my, you know, the influence of orthodox readings of it on me, but I see it as almost kind of reversing that ascent narrative. So, yeah, so in that sense, it's kind of connected, but is, is the anti-Gnostic almost. Yeah. Well, you know, the Gnostics said the way up is the way down, right? Yeah, that's true. You must first yeah. descend. Well, Nick, Nick, it's interesting you brought that up because one of the things I, I pulled out of the end when I was reading it is that uh, basically it's just one empire replacing another empire. It's just a big gang yeah. fight, right? Okay, <laughs> so, and, um, you know, street gang fight or the cops versus the gangs or whatever. And th in the end, the big reward is you get another capital city like you already had. Yeah. It, 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 yeah, it's just, I mean, it's just yeah. old boss, a new boss, same as the old boss. It's God's empire replacing the, uh, you know, the Roman empire or whatever. But right. I do think there is another way to read that, which mm -hmm. is not quite as hierarchical at the end, which for me relates to the death of God stuff. Okay, interesting. All right. Yeah, let's come to uh, the as as Nick knows, as people have been picking up from the show, it's not my it's not my driving passion, but I've been really diving into atheistic Christianity and death of God stuff a lot lately. Uh, and we're recording this during Lent, a great time to talk about uh, death of God theology. But we will come back to that. But Deacon Angie, it is time to nerd out in a different direction. Another one of my passions, a a certain theologian named Margaret Barker, um, <laughs> okay. who who may have come up on the show previously. Yeah, I mean. Um, it's very interesting to, to look at it as far as, as, um, you know, Margaret Barker talks about the, the great lady quite a bit, and I, I am definitely going to be having a special place for that concept in my heart. Um, you know, that the book of Revelation harkens back to so many different historical aspects of the, of the great ladies, the, the tree of life or, or the descriptions of the red dragon with the lady, all, all of that good stuff that I'm sure Deacon John can jump into a little better than I can. But so reading the book of Revelation and then hearing Margaret Barker talk about it, it made me more inclined to, to read about that. It's grasping for something that was, that is no longer. Um, that, that was really interesting. And, and, you know, as a woman in, in a fairly patriarchal spiritual tradition, trying to find some kind of femininity and finding it very difficult, but feeling the essence of it everywhere I go, um, I felt like she really helps lay it out so that you can grasp onto it a little more tangibly. Um, you know, she talks about, and at this point, I'm not sure if I'm going to be talking about the Book of Revelations or talking about her work, so because they, they blended together in my mind, but you know, the using the bread as, as, um, a representation of the great lady and and how traditionally women were baking the bread and how when i'm listening to the podcast i was also breaking you know baking bread and just like being part of being feeling part of that larger tradition and that the book of revelation is sort of a last hurrah to reach to it i thought that was very interesting but that's sort of yeah, I, I she loves this book. She has a six hundred uh, page book about this book, which I did not read in preparation because I didn't read the whole thing. <laughs> I read the little synopsis. It was like seventeen pages. It was delightful. Yeah, yeah, she loves this book. But but to give a little bit co uh, of context, uh, it, I believe she does. She does multi layered, and as I said, I think it went through you know at least two redactions. So I, I think that they are criticizing both the Second Temple and Rome and Christians they don't like. And, you know, you get to have your cake and eat it too. Uh, the book is subtweeting lots of people. But very quickly, you know, the great lady is is the, this feminine aspect of God that was known in the First Temple, in, you know, the people who would become the Judeans, the people who would become Jews later, I, I guess we can call them Hebrew. Um, and when uh, and there was a religious reform that really took out the divine feminine from the First Temple. Um, and when that temple was destroyed and the second temple was built, the great lady is missing entirely. Um, and there were still uh, uh, groups of people who remembered the lady at the temple and were very uncomfortable with the second temple. So, you know, part of her thesis would be the the, the, the lady with the the, 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 the stars of her, uh, of her head with the moon at her feet represents the, the great lady, uh, represents the first temple, represents the hopes of, of her being restored. And, and of course, the great lady of the temple becomes Sophia uh, and she's associated with wisdom. 
um, in, in, in the Gnostic tradition, and the sex worker of Babylon would be the uh, the second temple, right? As well as being Rome, and these things sort of all get tangled up up together. But I I find it I, I find it pretty uh uh, 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 um, uh, uh, uh yeah I, I really uh, I really groove on her ideas and generally I really groove on it in this you know the we we I think people read this and we associate the the woman in uh, who's dressed as the sun and had the moon under her feet and a crown of twelve stars on her head uh, who's about to give birth um, but uh, with Mary but she's not she's not called Mary right. So I think she is associated with Mary, and she's associated with Mary later on. But Mary was also associated with the Great Lady of, of the Temple. So I really do see her as as a Sophianic figure. And and you know I, I can also see the sex worker. I'll stop being being cute. Uh, I can also see the horror Babylon as as in sort of a philemic sense, where uh, as almost a Sephian Sophia. Because I, I am starting to agree with people. Um, there are certain scholars who who. who uh, when we read uh, Secret John and read some of the Cephian texts, we, we kind of mash all the divine female figures together, right? And they can be aspects and reflections of each other. But there is a theory that the Cephians didn't think that highly of Sophia. And um, that kind of gets reflected later on. You know, what got me thinking about this was, was some of the Platonic uh, Gnostics associated Sophia with the god of the witches, the goddess of the witches, right? The goddess of the, of the crossroads, who was, who was a, a, a character that... Uh, that the Greeks and Romans were uncomfortable with, right, and had mixed feelings about. So, anyways, I'm on. I'm on a rant. Uh, I better move on to. Oh yeah, I also like that. There's oh, there is the voice of the thunder. Ask, oh, go ahead, please. Oh, can I ask a question, uh, Deacon Angie? I, I, maybe you said it and I missed it. Uh, since you've read Barker, and I uh, I'm I haven't ventured bit. into the bar the Barkarian waters yet because I'm a little scared to do that. Um, it seems very overwhelming. Uh, and fascinating, but it just seems like a lot. So you have, and I'm wondering, you were just speaking about the great lady. Is that what she's called in Barker? Is that right? The... That's what Barker is calling her, yes. Okay. So I assume that that's, that's specifically the woman with with the moon at her feet in the in Revolution. Yeah. I mean, she talks, of, Barker talks about the great lady as, as, I think spouse is the wrong word, but co-creator with God. So she's there at the right. beginning of Genesis. Um, and she calls her, I mean, the, we have records of her being called Asherah or right, however, Asherah figure. however that's pronounced in, in a variety of different ways. And she, she sort of highlights, there's, there's several different pronunciations of the name, but it's very similar throughout multiple cultures. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, so she's there at the beginning and, and she's with people until she's essentially eradicated. Um, mm -hmm. how to compare the great lady to Babylon and what I read of Margaret Barker is that she didn't get into that. Now, of course, she's got the 600 page book that she likely does get into it because it doesn't seem a topic that Margaret would shy away from. Yeah, I, I oh, good. Okay, I think I think that is uh, the the uh, Babylon is uh, it's the second temple, right? So a parody of the uh, of the great lady. Mm -hmm. But to your point about um, the Sethians and Sophia being conflicted, I definitely get that sense of of the the Sophia in the Sethian text is not somebody you actually want to be connecting with. In that she's she's really made a huge mess of things, and, and to stay away from her. Yeah, um, uh, uh, Nick, were you going to say something? I think it, so. I think it's actually coming up next. But and it, so, Jonathan, your list is really good. But I was thinking that, and I think this is in Margaret Barker. I'm not an expert on Margaret Barker, but I think one of the understandings that she puts forward is that some of uh, the temple theology survives into Christian liturgy, yes. mm -hmm. um, which I, which to me is actually the main way to interpret this book is as a liturgical book. Um, so, I, and I think, you know, even in the kind of Orthodox Christian interpretations of the, the, you know, the, the kind of lady figure um, that has kind of made its way to some Marian theology and iconography. It's, it's frequently talked about as the church. Um, and then that kind of directly leads again to the end of the book with the New Jerusalem, which is also an image of this kind of glorified church. Um, so I think, which is constituted through the liturgy. So I think uh, there's a whole kind of liturgical aspect to the book which doesn't actually contradict necessarily the Margaret Barker thesis, but is kind of the way that it sort of it becomes subsumed or kind of subterraneanly kind of remains within the tradition, but through the liturgical 
uh, stuff in Christianity, uh, which have taken some of the temple forms. So to me, that's actually like the, the best way to read the book is as a liturgical document. And so maybe we could talk about that. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, that's what yeah. Barker says. She loves yeah. the liturgy, particularly Eastern forms of it. But she sees she sees those coming straight from the temple. Um, yeah, I mean, it's really hard to read the book this book without seeing the liturgy in it. It, it is obviously a um, uh, a liturgical text. It is uh, it is portraying you know real rituals that people did. Um, it is showing liturgy both in heaven and earth. But actually, talk about the liturgy both in heaven and earth brings us to the strongest, most obvious theme of the book, and and why. It can be reclaimed from uh, evil political powers that have been abusing it for years, right? Which is that it, it's obviously an anti-empire book. It's it's talking about Rome. Uh, you know, the beast. The the it, it more or less tells you um, the uh, uh, what is the quote? Oh, geez, I had it here. But the uh, the seven hills, the seven heads in yeah, Rome. Yeah, Rome. It actually says the seven heads are the seven hills. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, and Rome is the city of the seven, seven, uh, uh, seven hills. Six, 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 or six one six. You you can use uh, gematria to uh, maybe I'll get I don't know Nick. Maybe you can explain gematria really quick. But you can uh, uh, you can use gematria to get uh, 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 Kaiser Nero, Caesar Nero. Um, the uh, the Antichrist is obviously Nero. Uh, Nero had had just uh, recently died, right around the time that this book was written, and. Uh, there was uh, rumors and legends that Nero was going to come back to life as the beast does. Actually, there was Nero impersonators who who, yeah. who had tried to say that in sort of the outer <clears throat> regions of the empire with people who had never seen the emperor before, hey, I'm Nero, come back to life. You know, you should you should let me rule you. Um, so, uh, it, and of course, you know, the, the Christians are very oppressed. Um, the, the book does talk about, you know, uh, you are the poor and I'm going to comfort you. Um, and... I can't remember the name of the writer, Nick. It was the, the article. Uh, Wes Daniels is Re Resisting Empire. Yeah, Resisting Empire. Yeah. He talks a lot. They talk a lot about the um, um, the liturgy of, of God and the liturgy of Earth, right? And, and that this book sets up. That's one of the reasons it uses the, the liturgy, why it uses this liturgical um, uh, symbolism, because it, it's saying, you know, like there is the liturgy of God, which we can go join in. Right, we can go join the feast of mm -hmm. God with the people of God with the liturgy of God uh, at any time, actually, mm -hmm. uh, and it can comfort yeah. us and it can strengthen us. It can bring us closer to God to get through these these travails. But there's also the liturgy of the earth, which is the liturgy of the empire, the liturgy of Rome, uh, and it is a liturgy of destruction. It is a ritual of humiliation. It is a ritual of the destruction of the poor and, and those that believe. So, so what do people think about some of the? Oh, sorry, Nick, could you first explain Gematria really quick and maybe how <laughs> you know how they get six 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 out of that and then, then maybe we can talk about some of the political. I, don't, I cannot there. tell you how they get six secrets in this. Gematria obviously being like where you know in Hebrew Hebrew letters and in Greek too, depending on you know what you're using, have numerical values, and that you can uh, figure out like kind of the cumulative numerical value of words and phrases, and then through that figure out correspondence between them. So I don't know where that for Alistair Crowley, believe that six 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 was the number of humanity or the number of a man. Actually, is what he would have said. And, uh, and then also connected to the sun. So that is, he had his, old, his own gematria for that. I don't know how the book gets to that, actually. Yeah. The, uh, yeah, I, I think it is pretty straightforward, though, because, uh, uh, the, and of course, Greek, uh, the Greeks, the Romans, and the Hebrews uh, all used um, letters to represent numbers, right? So that's that's why it's quite easy to to do gematria. So people reading it would have would have got who six 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 is uh, pretty easily. Mm -hmm. But yeah, any other comments on, on I, sort of the? Pl oh, go ahead, Jason. I, sorry, I just I did wanted to to push there a bit. Do we know that gematria was happening around the time of 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 uh whatever the whenever this book was being written like we is do. that I, okay yeah I, I just wasn't sure i mean i've always felt Gem gematria is is dodgy so i yeah. was like when did the dodginess begin is basically my question <laughs> even margaret barker talks about it being being contemporary so you know if we're going by her as an expert she she also okay. agreed with it great yeah yeah but, apparently it oh sorry it apparently is related to aramaic and hebrew so narrow caesar in the hebrew alphabet would actually add up to 666 yeah um and the books most certainly it, it might be one of the the few new testament books that that was originally in hebrew um they know that it was originally in, in hebrew because it uses a lot of uh hebrewisms or i uh, sorry hebrew or aramaic uh it uses because they both have some of the same uh, uh cliche sentence structure what have you 
that uh, that it was quite possibly in that language originally translated into Greek or written by somebody who's very saturated in that uh, language and does not know Greek very well. Uh, Clark Clark has just uh, been caught up into into the heavens, um, so he can't he can't comment on the Greek, but it, it is apparently very poor and in full of these. Uh, full of these Hebraisms. Can I speak so. to the liturgy and the empire bit a little bit? Um, please, please. Yeah, I, so I, I think I think the important thing we didn't mention yet is that, um, is, and I Russ Daniels in that book does mention this a lot, which is one of the recurring phrases in the book and kind of arguably the protagonist is the slain lamb. So it's not just, you know, God, God the Father or Jesus. It's actually the lamb that was, that looks like it says the lamb that was slain, but it's the lamb that was standing up and looks like it was slain. <laughs> so it's basically a dead lamb also with seven horns and seven eyes that is the hero of the book. Mm -hmm. And I think, and and the way West reads this and other people, um, I think the reason this book has actually been used really frequently in kind of a radical political way in, you know, liberation theology and empire critical biblical studies and other kind of places is because the slain lamb and then the martyrs that are mentioned throughout the book are, you know, poor and dispossessed people that the empire has been oppressing. So the, the idea that this book was written in some relationship to, you know, the after the, the Jewish and Roman war, the destruction of the temple, you know, all of that, there's a context of oppression of, of the Jesus movement that this book is being written out of. And so the oppression of, you know, a poor and marginalized group in the empire. And then the hero of the book is is a slain figure, this, this you know, oppressed and, 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 and marginalized minority, basically. Um, so I think it's important that this conversation about it is true that that the narrative is like an empire, one empire replacing another. So God's empire over the Roman Empire. But there is this element of it being like a this canonic empire. It's emptied, self-emptied. So it's it's an empire that is centered around, you know, the, the poor and marginalized as opposed to centered around kind of imperial glory or power if you're taking it in that historical context. Um, and then I also think that then the death of God piece that does play out is that the liturgy itself in in Christianity in, in that that as it starts to develop in liturgical theology is participating in this you know oppression and and crucifixion of Jesus. So you go to the liturgy; it's not like an abstract um, kind of ritual. It's actually you entering into this the, the death uh, of this person, um, the slain lamb. So it's the liturgy of the lamb when you go to go to mass, um, and then you know, the, the resurrection or the new Jerusalem that emerges out of that. And when we get into that part of the book, I think it, it becomes clear is, is no longer a kind of hierarchical um, kingdom where it's like, we're here, God's up there vertically, but it's kind of becomes a flat, you know, a flat and imminent, imminent, imminent world where God dwells with us and kind of, kind of equally to everyone. So I think that there is a really beautiful narrative that you, the only way you can get to it though, is by remembering that the slain lamb that, that oppressed people are actually at the core of the, kind of the subject of the book. Otherwise it becomes this abstract, you know, sort of crazy, <laughs> like a psychedelic thing. Yeah. I, um, so I, I just want to make sure I was in there. Oh, please. Okay. Uh, and I was just going to agree with you and, and, and uh, say you're spot on it. And again, to clarify about the liturgy and what's going on with the liturgy uh, and connecting to the slain, slain lamb is, you know, you, you are joining the death of Christ, which is joining his oppression. Right, mm -hmm. we we are we we all uh, take place. We all take part in in the oppression of empire, right? Uh, uh, and therefore have solidarity. When I say we all take, well, we all take. I mean, we. Uh, you know what I mean. <laughs> I, I meant yeah. to clarify your point, Nick, and I just take. No, I think that's good because we participate. I mean, the liturgy is not an abstract kind of yeah. reenactment, but it's a participation in in the slain lamb. So yes. from that, it, it changes it. So quick, quick question then. I, I missed half of this. Sorry. Um, uh, I'm not good with computers, so it almost killed me or I almost killed it. I don't know which. So, uh, okay. So it sounds like you're saying what I caught was that when God's heaven, a kingdom comes down here, things go from vertical to horizontal and that we have to get there by identifying with Jesus. But I did not get that in the book. What I got was that Jesus was an oppressor in the book. He walks mm -hmm. around with an iron rod to keep all the Gentiles in line. And I'm thought long and hard about this iron rod thing and i don't see it as anything other than a physical threat it's, it's i think it's clear violence so i'm not really sure how we do that so I, I probably missed that i'm sure you have an explanation for it but i was wondering what it was i mean i think that so jesus does does seem pretty violent when he's mentioned as jesus that's the little mm -hmm. separate figure from the lamb in the book i do think that the oh they're not time, the same 
No, I think that the lamb is Jesus, but I think that the, that imagery, there's two sets of imagery going on. But I would also say yeah. that an oppressed people writing a book that includes violence, mostly reacting to the oppression they're facing, isn't quite the same thing as, you know, as as imperial violence. So I, right, right, right. I wouldn't so, want to condemn the revolution. Violence, violence are two different things, for sure. Yeah. Um, I agree with you on that. But I just didn't see the self-defense of violence in that. That's, but I, I mean... I have to reread it. I'm sure it's just in there. I just missed the indication that it was self-defense. Um, this this is actually like uh, uh, Clark's ask, uh, question sort of also spurred on something that I was really reacting to, which was that like, it's that thing of like, um, it's not getting rid of the empire. It's just replacing it with another empire. Um, like, which which to me rankled. I was like, to me, the uh, the whole thing about like what I, lo what I love about Gnosticism as I, encounter it is its apophatic quality it's 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 engagement with something that's indescribable and and in that sense very like there's a solidarity in the sense that we're all going to be part of or, or are part of one thing um and so i think like yeah like in a way this feels if not anti-gnostic at the very least maybe for me like it it's revolutionary maybe in that sense the same way like the french revolution was revolutionary but there's also a sense of perpetuating a um a form because you don't have anything else to replace it with you know like uh you you break up all the courts and then you have to form new courts you know um but because this isn't a political document trying to describe a thing that people should do like uh you know like here's our here's our to-do list it's right. like a it's it's a science fictional or fantasy document proposing a like a a metaphysical change like i'd, I'd love to see a gnostic revelatory gospel that wasn't that, that wasn't uh, like saying like here's the new boss he has to wear the same suit as the old boss you know but i would still not so i'm going to push back on both of those things a little bit and and which is that i don't think it's a is the same as a, as the same as the old boss because of the identification one because of the identification of the new boss as being this slain lamb who was slain in the context of this empire so it's just not it, the the lamb doesn't heal <laughs> like the wound doesn't go away it rem that that remains that that kind of marginalization and oppression kind of remains in the lamb's identification throughout the book and becomes kind of a central part of of the people in the new jerusalem's you know their own kind of citizenship in that capital city or something it's it, i think there's a change the other thing i would say about it is you know in terms of the oppression or the context of that part of that is is the historical context of the book that's been proposed by scholars but i think it's in the book in the parts about the martyrs. So it can seem very violent, but there's multiple pieces where the blood of the martyrs cries out and says, how long do we have to wait for, you know, this to be this this reality to be reversed because we were martyred. And so in the context of it about, you know, the coded message about Nero, uh, the persecution of, of the early Jesus movement, you know, it, it can only really be read historically in that context of people who are already being kind of crushed politically. So I think losing that it, it, it stops to kind of work that well um, and does then become the new boss and the old boss. But I think with that context, and I think that that reality of of the slain lamb, I think it does change it. And and so like what John, John said, I think thinking about liturgy as participation in the death of Christ is very important. If you lose that piece, it can start to become a, a slightly more abstract, you know, I don't know, like divinity and divinity, but to, to, the, it, it stays centered if it remains with that kind of very human death of a person by this empire. So that's what I'd say about it. But it doesn't resolve the book of all the issues, but, you know. No, no, for sure. And uh, I, I think, too, there, there's a lot of parody in the book because, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the word for kingdom of heaven is the same word used for, for the Roman Empire, right? It, really, we should be translating it empire of heaven. And the Roman emperors call themselves living gods, right? So um, that's why we have this, this antichrist, this fake god, a uh, very Gnostic concept. Uh, uh, and um, it's, it's always called contrasting the um the uh, the kingdom of, of of heaven sorry the empire of heaven with the 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 empire uh of rome right or the black let's call it the black iron empire um and, and this happens throughout the book over and over again so for instance nero the antichrist has a wound that doesn't heal in his head right mm -hmm. just like the slain lamb but the slain lamb is a real deal the other thing too about the imminence that that, that nick's talking about is looking at it as as a joanine text having some sort of relationship to the other joanine texts there's there's the theory that, that the joanines 
Joe Knights, whatever you want to call them, that um, that that they didn't necessarily believe in in the resur in the bodily resurrection as we know it, or or sorry, in the in the second coming. They didn't believe in the second coming. They uh, or sometimes a resurrection. Maybe there's a version of the Gospel of John that doesn't have a resurrection at the end. Anyways, Jesus comes back in the hearts of the Joanites, right? Imminence. That's the, so that's why this is if you look through it through that lens, that's why this is not a replacement of the empire, right? Because there is no new ruler because God has come to earth in the hearts of everybody. Uh, so there's radical equality. Uh, and that's why he can, temple, right? Yeah, yeah. God. Oh, I was going to say that. That's why he yeah. can wipe our tears away, right? Because we are all wiping, we're wiping each other's tears away. Yeah. And I think that part, so at the end where after the new Jerusalem comes down, I saw no temple in the city for its temple is Lord God, the almighty and the lamb. It becomes, there's no, there's, there's no need for any kind of cultic worship anymore that would have been present you know, in the second temple or in the empire, because God is now with us in that way. And specifically God in the form of this slain lamb. So I think that that, that, that to me is actually a death of God message. It's kind of the dead body of God or the dead body of the lamb that is now with us. And, you know, so to me, that's a kind of a radical imminence going on by the end of the book. Yeah. But uh, d don't, don't get me wrong, Clark, Jason, uh, like, like, uh, you know, Bart Ehrman really doesn't like this book and really sees it as, as, as a violent discriminatory book. And it is that as well. Right. <laughs> like, you know. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. as Nick said, it doesn't explain everything. It's just a no. different light to think about it. It's a new yeah. light. I have to reread it in that light yeah. um, with the details as I understood them. Yeah, it's like, but you, but there is tensions in the book, right? Like it, mm -hmm. it is hard to, to to have one reading of it because uh, uh, because you know the, the, it, it is a book that has a lot of polarities, that has a lot of tensions and what have you. So something else that, that, that the book is 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 often written up for that that it's often seen as guilty of is is misogyny, right? So I, I think probably the best person to speak about that would be Jason. I'm kidding, uh, Deacon Angie. Do you do you have any do you have any takes on on misogyny and the uh, the book of Revelation? I mean, honestly, like it's so overwhelming that with the misogyny that it's it's hard to even say anything about it. Like, it it just I don't know. I on, honestly, it, it's sort of one of those things that that it just it's hard to even it's hard to even relate to it beyond you know. I can I can kind of stand it when I'm thinking about Margaret Barker's, you know, guy back, you know, back to the great lady. But as far as far as all the other stuff, I mean, just imagery of of, you know, abusing women, it, it's just it's just constant through through the, you know, Old Testament and and frankly, most of Christianity, and, and it just I, there's not a, there's not a whole lot to say about it. <laughs> I, uh, sorry, you did remind me by by invoking Saint Barker that uh, that there was to, to bring it back to some positive depictions yeah. of of uh, uh, of women, which is there's a mysterious little passage, which is after he called out, the seven thunders answered with a roar. As soon as they spoke, I was about to write, but I heard a voice speak from heaven: "Keep secret what the seven thunders have said. Do not write it down." Uh, and of course. Like that, that's pretty puzzling where this is a revelation. <laughs> um, and uh, part two is the voice of the thunder. Who, you know, the voice mm -hmm. of the thunder is, uh, is a Gnostic name for Sophia. So I think that might be another, another uh, uh, secret uh, 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 appearance of, of the Lady of the Temple. Um, hey, everybody wants to listen. We're actually already getting close to an hour, um, but everybody wants to hear me rant about things that I autistically fixate on, right? Um, but the, uh, the Clark, you might like this. So mainstream biblical, I, I believe this to be one of the earliest books of the New Testament, right? It's it's Paul's letters and this. Because uh, to give some of the context that, that Nick was talking about, which I should have given at the top of the show, the book is probably from, you know, like 72 AD. Uh, uh, Nero, who died in 69 AD, was oppressing and persecuting and martyring the Christians. Then Rome comes in and destroys the Second Temple. It's a horrific war uh, uh, on, on the Jews, on the Hebrews, on, on Israel, of everybody who belonged to those communities. The, you know, we're, we're talking uh, war crimes that, that are almost inconceivable. And this is the context that the book is written in, all of this oppression, right? Um, but I, it does, it's very hard to read it and not see it as an early text for a variety of different reasons. Um, a lot of biblical scholars want to recreate an early Christianity that has a very uh, volkish um, uh, 
folky Jesus, right? Who who doesn't have very sophisticated ideas, who uh, uh, doesn't have any anything to do with liturgy, um, who may think that the end of the world is coming soon, but he's very unsophisticated about it. And he's viewed his theology is viewed through the lens of, of a later Judaism. Right? We're trying to, it, there has been very important work done uh, understanding the Jewish Jesus, right? Uh, and mm -hmm. this, this was a big part of 20th century um, biblical studies. But I, I find that often we are viewing him through later developments in Judaism, through rabbinic Judaism. Uh, I also find a classist as well, because there's, there's this idea that that if you're a working class person like Jesus probably was, you can't have wild theology. You can't have wild ideas. But I mean, you know, like I know lots of, I know working class people who, who have all sorts of ideas about uh, a religion. You know, there's lots of working class people who have written sci-fi and fantasy novels. So they, they can, they can really right. get some, some pretty, some pretty amazing uh, uh, stuff. So in this book, I find the importance of liturgy very early liturgy. These people must have been doing liturgy. Where did it come from? If this book predates uh, much of the Bible, possibly even Mark, I think it predates Mark, here we have stuff, quotes from Jesus. Um, there are quotes from Jesus throughout this book that we find in the, the Gospel of Mark and find in the Gospel of John. Uh, I think most scholars would say that, that you know, the writer of Revelation got it from those books or got it from oral traditions or got it from mm -hmm. Jew, which doesn't exist. But, um, I, I would say that, that the, these are probably genuine memories of what of what Jesus taught. Um, and he might have, uh, Margaret Barker really uh, turned me on to this, uh, Deacon Angie. You might appreciate it. Um, but the, um, you know, how many times have I read this book and I never noticed that the opening is, this book is the record of the events that Jesus Christ revealed. God gave him this revelation in order to show his servants what must happen very soon. Right, but it, mm -hmm. the book says at the very beginning that the Jesus had these revelations. Um, so this is sort of a build out from this writer of some of the things that Jesus told him. Now I'm hoping you know some of the extreme yeah. violence and some of the misogyny. You know, obviously this is these are the teachings of Jesus uh, tinged through this this horrific lens that we talked about and through this this own writer's gnosis, right? But I, I really think that this is an important uh, picture of early Christianity that a lot of scholars reject because they really want to have a very pro this is unconscious. They want to have a very Protestant folky Jesus, right? Without any of this well, Catholic. Stuff. Yeah, I would say also with that, because of the liturgical context, you know, the way I would interpret it, and John of Patmos has this vision, he says specifically on the Lord's Day. So presumably he would have engaged in worship. And then, so one of the interpretations of this book is that it's the internal, it's kind of like a psychedelic internal description of of what's happening when you're participating liturgically, which yes. is a, seems a little esoteric, but you can read some very, not I wouldn't recommend it necessarily, but you can read some Roman Catholic pretty mainstream Catholic books about that, that this book is about the mass, uh, including like Scott Hahn's book, the, L the Lamb's Supper, which is a pretty good book, has terrible puns in it. But, uh, but okay, you know, so, oh yeah, you might like it. <laughs> but the, the way I, that, oh, go I've ahead. I've got to say, yeah. that is not uh, 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 selling a mass, a Catholic mass for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it might, well, it depends, I guess, it, what your what your kinks are. <laughs> but like, but I do think it kind of like, uh, you know, when it's understood that way, hopefully without some of the imagery and, and the ways it's kind of, you know, woven together through whoever wrote it, you know, own experiences and biases, it, it portrays, you know, like we said, this participation in the death of Christ, that that's how they would have understood what they were doing in liturgy, that, you know, the site. So in some, you know, all, even all of the really ragged and, and violent and, and seemingly kind of discussing parts of it are related to that experience of the early Christian movement in what happened to, you know, this person that they revered. So I think that there is something to be said about it in that way, that it's a participation in the liturgy without kind of whitewashing the liturgy from ultimately being a representation of this horrific death of this person in torture. So, which a lot of the time does get whitewashed out. So I think that that, it doesn't recommend you the Catholic mass, but it might be true. <laughs> I, uh, th I, I'm really glad that you brought some of that up because of the, the inner interpretations. I'm oh, sorry, were you going to say something, Clark? Oh, no, I, this is all new ideas to me, and so I'm just taking it in. This is very interesting. I, so I noticed I, the quotes of details about the religious uh, 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 activities going on, but that's... Yeah. yeah. 
I think outside of the liturgy or, or inner liturgy, yeah. I mean, he basically does tell us, Nick, that that, that I, this happened to be during liturgy, right? So, um, so an inner depiction of liturgy, but uh, mystics since have viewed it as an inner text, right? So I can see, like, everything is, is creative, not everything, but the creative reinterpretation of symbol sets is, is how religion, quote unquote, works. And the, the imagery in this book is so powerful that, that I think for inner imaginative work, it could be quite powerful. So, um, so for instance, uh, Gnostic Ascent, right? There's there's people trying to recreate Gnostic Ascent. We don't know exactly what they did, but here we have seven seals, seven angels. In many Gnostic Ascent systems, there's the seven archons and the seven planets, right? So maybe maybe somebody could use this to construct a ritual or guidish uh, meditation where they're doing Gnostic Ascent, and this is what you have to overcome through each, or each archon, right? Um, uh, something else that the people have been doing for the last couple hundred years is saying that this is this is the Kundalini experience. Uh, this is this comes from the Theosophists, that each of the seven seals is the seven chakras. And this is what is happening in your enlightenment experience because, you know, enlightenment can often be very difficult and, and, and hard. And of course, as Nick said, maybe it's an inner depiction of what's happening during the liturgy. But do you folks have any, any reflections on, on sort of Inner inner meanings of the text, or perhaps re you know uh, reappropriating it to use some of its symbolism for you know path working. I mean, if it's inner, I can see a lot of PTSD stuff going on in it. That's for sure. Yeah, <laughs> I think that might be yeah that might be there too, right? Yeah, it is. Yeah. It is. They, the, how how could you go through the destruction of Jerusalem? How could you go through Nero's right. persecutions and not have PTSD? Yeah, yeah exactly. Here's here's kind of what I'm, what I'm grappling with, with like uh, this whole time is that I think like there's some been really, some really interesting stuff. Nick, I want to point out actually that your point about if this is a revolutionary text from an oppressed group, like there is sort of, there, there's sort of that thing where like, it's not fair to demand that a group that's been oppressed be enlightened enough to both throw it, like combat the, that oppression and somehow have this benevolent vision. Like that might be too much to 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 ask. I, I'm I'm not totally sure. I buy I like like I say it's a speculative text, so I, uh, part of me wants it to go there anyway. But that said, um, part of what I really grapple with is that like I think yes, I I can see like and actually the idea of uh, the, as, a, as an ascent, like if if revelation were essentially my imaginative uh, um, writings as I fought myself as I was trying to meditate. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like uh, just learning to meditate. Like um, I, Jason, d decided I was going to meditate every day of the year, and this is what happened to my brain. <laughs> you know, the revelations of Jason. I mean, I'm I'm joking, but I think like that idea of the 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 struggle as depicted so imaginatively. I think that's totally possible. But where I'm going here is that I'm having also a really hard time divorcing this from the 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 Bible as a corpus of text that has been used a certain way throughout history. Yeah. And that like, and that like, it's totally possible to read all of this stuff this way and to like reinterpret it. But like, I'm just kind of angry that it's in the Bible as a, it's in the Bible. It's at the end of the Bible. It doesn't say, Oh, and by the way, he's totally talking to these churches that are like within his lifetime. And he's totally referring like there's, there's a political cartoon element. Like it does because the, the Bible that I'm holding right now doesn't doesn't prepare me for that, you know. Yeah, I mean, um, I would. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Well, like, and that that's kind of why I started off my my like hot take with like it's just a shame that it's in the Bible because this book, like, it says Holy Bible. It sounds like I should read everything in here straight faced, you know. That is why people um, have wanted to take it out, <laughs> even including like even Martin Luther. So yeah. Yeah, I can I can totally see that, and like, um, and so there's there's sort of the like I and maybe leaning into the struggle is just something I've got to do, and I'm kind of free freestyling here, guys. But like, there's a there's a thought I keep having, like, um, is the is there value in reclaiming something that has had such bad stuff associated with it? You know, like a lot <laughs> of bad stuff. Yeah, I mean. I've sort of been talking about this in, in personal conversations quite a bit. So there's like a pre-empire religion and a post-empire religion, right? And now this book was written pre-empire, so it's going to be in a completely different context. But once I have yet to come across an 
and if there is an example, I would love to see it, but an example of religion that went from pre-empire to actual administrative, you know, civil body, I haven't seen that transition ever happen gracefully. Like, it, it doesn't matter what religion it is, once it goes from being something people practice to something that administers how people need to live in a societal way, it, it completely distorts it. And 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 I think we really run up to this with the book of Revelations because again, it was written in a time where, where essentially the priests in Christianity were not the actual judges of civil cases, you know, to, you know, arguing over over land, right? Like that that context and those two contexts are so drastically different that that I think yeah we when but we're we're reading it after, you know, fifteen hundred years of empire religion and we're trying to divorce ourselves from that in some regard. But it's it's so intertwined and so messy, and and so many of our foundations are built on it that it's just it's a hot mess. Um, so that's my take on that. I, I would say that in terms of if it, it it doesn't make sense to reclaim it, I mean I think unfortunately the type of reality it's describing and maybe the trauma that it comes out of is just in our world, and we can't. It's not something that we're going to get away from. So I, I feel like almost getting rid of it though is you know people are going to write from those experiences again you know, having to deal with it or go through it to the other side, which is kind of what happens in the text. You go through all this horrific shit and then you get to the side of every tear wiped away. I mean, I think that that process is what history is like and what our experience in the world is like. So I would, I would be hesitant to just get rid of it, I guess. Yeah. I, you know what, what I would say is it's something we need to appropriate more from, from Jewish traditions, culturally appropriate is, is really interrogating and arguing with the text because uh, for instance, uh, a Jewish interpretation of these, the sacrifice uh, of Abraham by his son, the, the attempt at sacrifice, right? Is that, is that Abraham failed and God, God came in at the last moment to save his son because he was like, what the fuck are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> like you just yeah. screwed up, buddy. Like I gave this to you as a test to win the test. You had to not go sacrifice your son to me. Yeah. What's the matter of your brain? Um, so, so I think sometimes having that approach uh, can, can, can help us. And, but I think it is important to argue with these texts and to keep them because they're, they're, they're in our, they're in the collective unconscious of the West, right? They're not going away. There's Christians out there using them all the time. If we want to get rid of them, they're still going to be used, right? We also have 2000, again, even like art, right? We have 2000 years of great art coming out of this book. How are we going to engage with that art, understand that art, critique that art without, without uh, dealing with the book? Finally, for keeping I, it in the Bible. Oh, go ahead. I, sorry, I, I want to say here, I don't think like, I, I don't think I'm, I'm trying to say we should take it out of the Bible because, I mean, that ship has sailed <laughs> <laughs> thousands of years, like at least a thousand some years ago. The, the ship is so sailed. <laughs> the ship's come back around again. My, uh, But I think like my point there about how it's not like, there's nothing at the beginning of the book. Like, you know, it, it feels to me that there should, there almost would need to be like a, for you to start reading it like every few pages there has to be just a little like asterisk and then at the bottom it says like note here's some historical context for this yeah. note this yeah. is where this is coming from yeah. like um because I've that's kind of Bibles that, do, that do that and i, I completely yeah. agree with you jason yeah it's i'm sorry to um, interrupt you but yeah, I have my, seen my it official it. catholic bible does do that too yeah. <laughs> not that that's okay. like yeah, yeah. not all of them do and they not really should that. yeah sorry, like, jason, yeah that's the thing this one didn't and i bought it yeah. at a bookstore yeah. you know um uh, and I think that that's kind of more the thing I keep talking about is that like, there's so many lines that I'm like, oh, that's where that line comes from that I've heard people leverage Great for terrible bad. things, you Great know? Things. Oh, sorry, um, bad things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Lots, lots of bad things. Uh, uh, Clark, but before we move on, uh, mm -hmm. as, an, as, as a, as a non-Christian Clark, do you, do yeah. you have, do you have any opinion on this at all? Or do you just not care? Oh, about the book? Yeah. Um, the book I mean, Bible and whatever. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I have opinions on all that, more opinions, in, 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 but um, uh, just on this book, I think um, if you're going to reclaim this book, if that's a good way to put it, it's a lot of hard work to be done. Um, I really appreciate the notion of trying to make this a more positive take on, the, on, on Empire, um, and I really have to sit down and rethink about that. 
because uh, my 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 opinion of of the revelation is is very bad. It's very negative. I see a lot of uh, I just see a lot of assholes beating each other up, including everybody in between the two assholes, um, and then justifying it later, um, you know, like a street fight. Uh, and it's 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 hard to see. So that's kind of my take on it. It's hard to see how this is redeemable, unless, of course, you're a Jesus person, and then Jesus may then that rewrites the whole story. Admittedly, it obviously does and makes it into a a better story. But when I read this book, the whole time I was reading this book, I just kept thinking, mm -hmm. Russian Revolution in 1918, Revolution in 1918, over and over again. All of the, all of the people are killing each other for a hundred different reasons and then it didn't stop and then some good things came out of that great things came out of that and then some horrible things came out of that and now here we are in the ukraine again for the same reasons it didn't stop it just cycled back around yeah. so i don't i don't really yeah. know what what this text the effect this text has on stopping the, the cycle of political violence in the world which well, is a nasty I, and very yeah. concerned with I would actually, that, yeah, I, I know I'm being the defender. You put Jesus in it, yeah. What was that, Nick? Yeah, I, I know I'm being the defender of the text, and like I no, said, no, 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 you should be. No, no, you know, it, and it's a little hard for me, like I, you know, I'm stumbling through it a little bit because, like I said at the beginning, this is a really sacred text to me because of, like you said, Clark, the Jesus thing. <laughs> so as yeah. I, I do identify as a Christian still, so I think, you know, I put it in the link in the chat. But Wes's book that that Jonathan's talked about, resisting empire, just to give some context, he's a Quaker mm -hmm. theologian. And Quakers who are, have a history of nonviolent resistance right. have actually read this text as part of their nonviolence, which seems very contradictory at first. But I think like you're saying, Clark, reading it through that lens of Jesus really changes it. And mm -hmm. one of the things I think it's probably in Wes's book, but I think it's also in other people like I know Rene Girard's writings about scapegoats, um, which Wes is building on as well, is that and I think the Russian Revolution comparison is really apt because Part of the argument from Wes is that this book is anti-scapegoating because the lamb that has been slain is the end of that process. So it never happens again. Yeah. It's represented in the liturgy because now that that it has shown the bankruptcy of 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 you know building a human empire on the basis of that kind of scapegoating and political violence because this yeah. has happened in this cosmic way. So I do think that it's not a text like a blueprint for doing a Russian revolution. Like you know what I mean? Like we're gonna read this and we're gonna carry this out as a revolution. It's about right. something internal, which then I think is why the cosmic and liturgical and mystical readings are important because it can't just be the literal. It has to be, I mean, I read the ending as a little Buddhist almost like this is something that's happening now and not something that's in the future. It's already right, happened. Right. So, yeah. yeah. And I'd like to say it'd be a pretty boring panel if we all had the same perspectives. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, Okay, we are, we're at an hour and 15 minutes. Uh, the, I'll wrap up, start to wrap up very quickly. Uh, something else I, I like about the book or it being in the Bible is, um, again, there's been so much work done about how different books of the Bible come from different communities, have different perspectives, have different Christologies, have different ideas about God, don't necessarily agree with each other. It's very important to understand this, right? This is one of the, this is kind of biblical studies 101 right, if you're going to take uh, secular biblical studies. But what we miss is that the editors of the Bible were very sophisticated. So there's there's a couple of reasons why this book ends the Bible. I mean, one is very literal, right? It's the end, the end, it's the end of the story. But another reason, too, is that it uses a lot of Genesis symbolism, you know, seven days, seven seals, the uh, the tree of life, uh, the tree is, is restored to earth, right? And people can go eat the fruit whenever they want. And, and something else that I find very interesting about the ending and and how it can be the story of humanity is, is how does Genesis open? Where's humanity? We're, we're in a garden. How does Revelation end? We're in a city, right? So this is the story. Mm. This is the story of humanity. Um, okay. Any any more hot takes before before we sign off? I would say that sometimes we've said it as revelations. I know, and, I know. And, and I have a joke about that, which is which yeah, Lily, my wife, heard at church camp when she was a kid, yeah. which is from a pastor, which is it's revelation, not revelations. The S is for Satan. So <laughs> every time you say it that way, you're letting Satan in. That probably doesn't. <laughs> yeah. I, I am a great spiritual multiplier. Yeah, I'm yeah. picturing Mar Thomas just grinding his teeth every time we said Revelation. Oh yeah, right. I said it as well, yeah. <laughs> as he breaks out in the meat sweats. <laughs> okay, excellent place um, to end. Oh wait, nope, uh, not I, I, I do. Go, Jason. 
Yeah, uh, uh, there's also one thing I need to mention. Um, probably before I read through the, the the book of Revelation for this uh, this podcast, I uh, the, my probably my closest connection to Revelation was somebody who did a web comic in like the early aughts that was uh, Pokemon inspired. So it's like manga Pokemon uh, inspired. It's still online. You could basically Google Pokemon web comic Revelation, or uh, it's called Apokemon. Um, and yeah, I just, I would suggest just go take a look. It's wacky. It's weird. It's like, it's tongue in cheek. Um, uh, so it, it's it, going back to Clark to your idea of, the, of it being a graphic novel. This is someone going like, this would be cool to draw. I'm not taking it seriously, yeah. but it's going to be cool to draw. Um, yeah. so, uh, yeah, uh, it, it, since Gnosticism has a, has a tendency towards heresy, I thought I'd reference a, a heretical yeah. webcomic. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll link it in the show notes. So. Uh, it, okay, any other hot takes? Okay. I lost track of how many times a third of the stars got knocked out of the sky. I think it was four. It is. I do really like this book, but it, it, it is a little repetitive, <laughs> to say the least. Okay, well, I had the perfect ending for the end of the world uh, show, which is, I heard a loud voice speaking from the throne. Now God's home is with human beings. He will live with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them, and he will be their God. He will wipe away all tears from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more grief or crying or pain. The old things have disappeared. And the one who sits on the throne said, and now I make all things new.